Now let's pick up with step three in that plan. Now step three, you want to get your uh, emergency fund up to three to six months of living expenses. Um, now an important point here is that the, if you're following Warren and Tagge's advice and only spending 50% of your money on necessities, then three months of total expenses is actually six months of necessities. Six months of total is 12 months of necessities. So this, can, this could actually, as long as you plan right and react to emergencies immediately, um, this could last you a good year all in your emergency fund. Now, a very important point is that this emergency fund really should be thought of as a form of insurance, right? where normally we would pay for insurance to cover a number of um, possible things that might happen to us. Um, this is a very flexible type of insurance that is sitting there, it's available to you, regardless of what the emergency happens to be. So it might be a big, big medical bill, it might be you lose your job, um, it might be your house burns down and you need money relatively quickly before your insurance company can release their funds to you. Right, so all of these things um, are covered simply by having money setting aside in a savings account. Now a big point here then would be the emphasis should really be on safety and liquidity. Make sure the money is available to you quickly um, and make sure that it is safe. We don't want to put this money in the stock market. Well, the stock market is a good long-term investment it has this nasty habit of being bad right when it's the worst time for it to be bad um, for you as an investor. So don't invest this money in the stock market, put it in a savings account, um, some place where it's going to be very safe. Now it's very important that uh, we keep this money separate from a saving up account, that is an account where you're trying to save up for some kind of goal, whether it be a an in-ground pool or a trip to Disney World or whatever. Um, the big reason being we don't want to take an emergency trip to Disney World. Right? So keep this money separate where it might be a little bit more difficult to get to than your saving up account, but where at the same time it is always available to you. Okay. Now, why three to six months? Um, it ends up that three to six months is a pretty typical amount of time for people to be between jobs. So if you lose your job three to six months later, you tend to be able to find a job um, that is roughly equivalent to the job you've lost. So it should get you by through that time. Now recently, the economy hasn't been as good um, here, speaking of 2013, um, so things have been lasting a little bit longer. Um, it's still on average three to six months should get you through most um, unemployment spells. And there's step 3B, that's saving a 10% down payment for a home. Uh, now, important things to remember about buying a home. Uh, one is that renting is not throwing your money away. When you throw your money away, you get nothing in exchange. When you rent, you get a home for a month. Right? So, um, renting is not the same as throwing your money away. So don't go leaping into buying a home because you feel like you're throwing your money away on rent. That's not actually what's happening. Um, and actually, I'd point out that one of the really important things you're getting when you rent is flexibility. Uh, otherwise, for you to get out of a house that you own, you have to sell the house, um, or you have to wait for it to be foreclosed. Neither of these is a particularly good thing. Um, on the other hand, getting out of a house that you're renting tends to be relatively easier. Um, breaking leases is a possibility, though it's naturally not a good thing, uh, but if you're renting month to month, you only have to give a month's notice, maybe two months notice, depending on you know, the agreement you have with your landlord, before you can get out. Um, and the reality is we live in a very mobile society where people do actually move around a lot and have to have that flexibility. So it's very important to provide yourself that flexibility if you need it. Uh, because of that, it's generally a good idea not to buy a home if you expect to move within the next five years. Um, it's an interesting thing that with most mortgages, um, you're going to just pay off enough of it in five years to pay a realtor to sell the house for you. So. Um, if you're going to have to move within five years, it's probably not worthwhile to buy a house. You'll actually end up losing money on it. You're probably better off renting. Um, it's also a good idea with a home, don't think of it as an investment. The reality is that if you think of it as an investment, it's not really a very good one. Um, investments shouldn't be taking money out of your pocket every month. A house does. Um, a house also has things that can go wrong with it, which will take more money out of your pocket if you own the house. So don't think of it as an investment. Instead, think of it as a place to live. Um, also, the reality is, well, we may think about, oh, but we know that homes go up in value. This is, on average, true, but they don't go up in value very fast. Um, over the long run, the increase in property values tends to roughly equal the rate of inflation. So, sure, having a house is better than having cash, which loses value at the rate of inflation, in that, okay, your house is going to maintain its real value rather than lose it. 
over the very long run, but there are much better investments out there uh, than a house, generally speaking. So think of it as a place to live. If you're buying this house, you now have a place to live, you don't have to pay somebody else for it every month. That's really what it boils down to. Um, it's also important to keep your mortgage and any related expenses, things like insurance, taxes, and the like, down to one quarter of your take-home pay or less. Um, the reason we do that is because, after all, if you lose your job, you don't want to have to immediately look at possibly losing your house as well. Um, give yourself that buffer. Uh, a traditional um, number would be something like your mortgage can be 40% of your income. I would advise against that. Keep it down to a quarter and you're okay. One note on mortgages. It's worth thinking about a 15-year fixed rate mortgage. I'm not saying that it's for everybody, but it might be worth thinking about. Think about a $200,000 house where you managed to put 20% down. So you put down a $40,000 down payment, you paid, paid all the closing costs and what have you. If you have a 30-year fixed rate mortgage at, say, 5.5%, your payment will be $1,022 every month. For a total over this 30-year term of almost $400,000. It's a good rule of thumb, if you're using a 30-year mortgage, it's going to cost you twice whatever you paid for the house. So look at the price of the house, multiply by two, that's going to be the total you're paying on a 30-year mortgage, typically speaking. Um, and a 15-year fixed rate mortgage, normally you can get a lower interest rate on because it's, sh it's a shorter term, so it's not quite as risky for the bank. Um, as a result, the payment is a little bit higher. It's $1,377 in this case, but when you add up the total, that almost $1,400 a month for 15 years only adds up to $267,858. So you're saving yourself a good $120,000 in getting out of debt twice as fast. That is a significant saving, so it may be worthwhile. Do the math. Look at what would it be for a 15-year fixed rate mortgage. What would it be for a 30-year fixed rate mortgage? Um, can you actually afford the 15 years? Um, that's a good way to get out of that debt very, very quickly. There are a couple mortgages I would generally advise avoiding. Um, one of them would be the adjustable rate mortgage. These were designed in the late 1970s, um, largely for the bank's benefit. Um, at the time, banks were looking at extremely high interest rates that they were having to pay on savings. Um, while at the same time, a lot of their mortgages were old when people had bought houses earlier in the 70s or in the 60s. So they weren't earning very much because interest rates on the loans they had given out were low, but they were having to pay a lot on savings accounts. So that it's going to be very high expenses for them. Right. So on the one hand, not much money coming in. On the other hand, a lot of money going out. So banks came out, came up with a way to handle this risk, and that is to force the borrower to be the one handling it. So it's an adjustable rate mortgage. If interest rates on the whole go up, the interest rate on your mortgage goes up. At the same time, if interest rates on the whole fall, the interest rate on your mortgage will fall. Um, all this really does is shift all of the risk for changing interest rates from the bank, who would normally bear it on a fixed rate mortgage, to you as the borrower. Now, often they will give you a slightly better interest rate than you might earn, than you might have to pay on a fixed rate mortgage. Uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of risk involved, and that risk can really come to bite people. Um, that's something that happened quite a bit um, during the housing bust in 2007-2008 during the financial crisis. Um, interest rates had risen substantially in 2005 and 2006, so lots of people found they couldn't afford the houses that they could before. Because it ends up when your interest rate doubles, which is very easy to do, going from say 4% to 8% is not a huge move in interest rates, um, it's going to roughly double your mortgage payment. A house that is affordable at 4% is not necessarily affordable at 8%. So if you lock in that interest rate, you're going to be protected from a lot of these changes. Then there are a set of um, what I would call terrible mortgages. I would pretty much say always avoid them. Just point mortgages have some uses that might be okay in certain cases. But these terrible mortgages I would always steer clear from. Um, one is the interest-only mortgage. Um, the interest-only mortgage has some period of time early in the mortgage life where you are only paying the interest, which means you're not paying down the loan at all. Um, and that is naturally a problem because eventually the bank wants their money back. So you're going to have this big increase um, in your payments when the bank decides to actually start collecting it. And actually this is all laid out ahead of time, but it still is a shock when that time comes. Um, the negative amortization loan just takes and makes the interest-only mortgage a little bit worse in that you're not actually paying all of the interest on the mortgage for the first part of the term, so the loan is actually growing for some period of time. Now recently, because the housing market hasn't been doing quite as well, 
interest-only mortgages and negative amortization loans have not been nearly as common as they were during the big boom years of, say, 2002 to 2004. Uh, but at the same time, these things may arise again if things start turning around quite a bit in the housing market, and I would do my best, if I were you, to steer clear of them.